Okay, looks like uh, got all of our stragglers in, so I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you all for coming out this afternoon. Uh, my name is Kevin Scaldaferri. Uh, I'm an engineer on the, uh, the architecture team at the Guild Group. Uh, I'm going to talk today about some of the infrastructure that we use uh, both for development and operations to support the uh, microservices architecture that we use in production. So, I want to first just quickly introduce um, the Guild Group and what we do. Uh, we're the, the largest flash sales sites for, uh, for designer clothing and other luxury goods in the U.S. Um, we do most of our business in men's and women's fashion. Uh, we also have verticals in uh, home furnishings, accessories, uh, travel packages, restaurants, spa deals, uh, all that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> our sales run for, uh, for 36 hours at a time, uh, very limited inventory of desirable items. Uh, and this results in a, a very large traffic peak every day at noon. Uh, this is sort of what our traffic graph looks like. Um, these first two are actually load tests that we ran during the night. And then uh, this thing here is, is the, uh, the peak once everyone gets their daily emails and uh, descends upon the site. Um, I think that last little bump is sometimes we do evening sales. So I, I believe that's what uh, happened at the end of the graph there. But this is the interesting thing. This is what we spend a lot of our energy on uh, trying to make sure that the site keeps working when that happens. So, and the, the company culture uh, really um, prioritizes rapid feature development um, and experimentation, trying things out, seeing what works and seeing what doesn't, and uh, you know, getting rid of things if they don't work and sticking with them if they do. So, so the company uh, has been around for about six years. Um, and we started out, as a lot of companies did during, uh, during that time, as a Ruby on Rails application uh, with the entire operations of the company uh, in, a, in a single Rails app. So back-end warehouse and fulfillment stuff, uh, sales planning, checkout process, uh, reporting, data warehousing, uh, all in, in one really big Rails application. Uh, ultimately, I think it peaked out at, at over 1,000 models and controllers, uh, 200,000 lines of Ruby, and a, and a big pile of Postgres uh, shared procedures as well. So, uh, and this sort of story, I think, has been you know, talked about by a lot of people, so I'm not going to dwell on it too much. You know, the advantages of getting started this way as a young company, so you get off the ground very quickly. Your initial development is, is quite quick. Uh, there's a simple model for doing development, a uh, simple deployment model, operational model is, is easy. Uh, everything's sort of nice until you reach a certain size, and, and then things start to get more complicated. Um, a, thousand, you know, a thousand model classes in one code base uh, without a really clear delineation between what team is responsible for what. Uh, uh, things can get tricky. People start stepping on each other. Uh, one team makes a change, it breaks something that's really important for another team. Um, that's, you know, that's a problem. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, test cycles get really big. I think at some point it would take probably two or three days for us to get through a test cycle to, to release a version of the website. Um, so that was, that was a really bummer as, as we were trying to, uh, you know, get new features out quickly. Um, and, and performance impacts uh, could, could creep up. So even if we passed all of our tests, uh, we might discover under production load that you know, someone had added a new, you know, a new join or some, something that looked relatively innocuous that actually just crippled the performance of the site. And uh, that sort of thing sort of came to a head uh, on a day about four years ago, uh, something called, uh, we refer to as the Louboutin incident. Um, so, uh, this is a Christian Louboutin shoe. Uh, for those in the, in the audience who aren't connoisseurs of women's footwear, um, this was a really big deal for the business. Uh, this was sort of uh, the equivalent of if we had convinced Apple to let us sell iPads at half price on the website. Um, it, uh, it, it was pretty much unheard of. Um, it was a very, very popular sale. Uh, Great for the for business development, um, and unfortunately, uh, sort of a bad day for the tech team uh, because the site pretty much melted under the load. So, um, in response to that, uh, we had to act pretty quickly to uh, to remedy some of the problems that arose there, and we started adopting a microservices architecture pretty aggressively. 
Um, so we very quickly moved our, uh, our core inventory tracking um, and shopping cart functionalities into, into microservices and, and over time moved more and more pieces uh, into, into services. And today we have about 200 uh, services and small web applications in production. And, uh, and our job on the architecture team is to really make that uh, manageable and allow you know, application developers to focus on, uh, on doing new features um, without having to spend a whole lot of time thinking about uh, operational aspects or, or the, the infrastructure. So um, initially, uh, we started doing the services. Most of the services at, uh, to start out with were, were pure Java. Um, and you know we were really running very fast just to try and keep uh, ahead of the load on the website and keep things up and running. So we accumulated a fair amount of technical debt back then, um, a lot of copy and paste, a lot of experimentation, uh, different competing approaches to, to the problems that we were seeing. Um, and, and eventually we mostly settled down on, um, on a build system uh, using Ant, which we distributed out to each of the services in the form of a, of a Git submodule, um, and continuing, for the most part, to use Capistrano for deployment. So I'll just take a brief moment to speak about Git submodules. Um, uh, this is not a way that I would recommend to uh, distribute software. Um, so even uh, you know, the experiences we found, like even people who understood Git fairly well uh, most people did not really understand how Git submodules worked. Um, as a result, uh, you know, people had a hard time knowing whether they were really up to date on the build system. It's not totally uh, obvious how you how you version your build system, and that led to, to some problems. Um, also, uh, <clears throat> as we, we started adding some some large build dependencies in, uh, we started using Scala, so we had to put the uh, the Scala compiler and, and runtime libraries into the submodule. Uh, things like less.js are a, a pretty big package as well that ended up in there at one point. Um, and the nature of Git submodules is that they end up getting copied into every single repository that you're using. So uh, this was very time consuming to, to clone these things down, used up a lot of disk space. Um, it was, yeah, not, uh, not optimal in a lot of ways. Um, we also started to become a little unhappy with Ant after a while. Um, Ant, you know, you, bet you specify your build in this sort of XML macro language. Um, it's a little funky. Uh, it's not terribly well documented. People, um, there weren't very many developers who were comfortable trying to expand the build system. Um, it's, at this point, not really the preferred tool even for Java, so a lot of tools were challenging to integrate with it. Um, and once we started using Scala more and more, uh, that, that sort of impedance mismatch really started to, to come to a head. Um, builds took much longer than they, than they really should have, uh, and, and pretty much nothing in the Scala development environment uh, hooked into Ant with uh, any ease at all. So, as a result of that, we, um, we started looking into SBT for our build system. Uh, this, so this is the, uh, these days it is the, the Scala build tool. Um, it was once upon a time the simple build tool, which until that turned out to be a horrible misnomer. So um, it's the Scala build tool at this point. So SBT has a bunch of stuff that's really neat about it. Um, it's, it's really designed to uh, work with Scala very nicely. Um, it does fast incremental builds of both Scala and Java code, um, including it has this tilde syntax, so you can uh, prefix any uh, SPT task with a tilde, and it will just keep running it, so it'll watch the file system for any changes. Uh, when one file changes, it computes every, you know, exactly what needs to be recompiled, uh, recompiles, reruns your tests. Um, it's a very nice uh, development loop. Um, it's also got this interactive shell where you can interact with the build system, uh, sort of understand what various settings in the build system are and interrogate them. Um, and, uh, uh, and it's got a console, which is basically a wrapper over the Scala REPL uh, with all of the dependencies for your system loaded in automatically, um, which, is, which is really nice for doing exploratory programming. 
Um, and uh, in principle, you know, all of the configuration and all of the extensions that you do to SBT um, are just Scala code. So you're writing in, in the same language that you're doing all the rest of your development. Uh, that said, um, it's a very sophisticated Scala that's, uh, that's used in, in SBT. Um, it, it really makes, uh, takes advantage of some fairly advanced features of the language. Um, it can be challenging for, for people to come and, and actually look at an SBT build specification and, uh, and understand what's actually going on there. They've, they've got a, a configuration DSL that's it, nice once you learn how it works, but um, uh, it doesn't necessarily look like the Scala code that people are using every day to write applications. Um, tied in with that, it, it has a fairly subtle mental model. So whereas things like uh, Ant and Maven are fairly imperative in their approach to how you specify a build, uh, SBT gets much more into the sort of functional and, and declarative uh, way of thinking about things. Um, and that can be a little bit hard to, uh, to wrap your head around and, and to debug. Um, and then going along with that, you know, we had you know, there are a lot of idiosyncrasies to, uh, to how, we, um, how we build and package software and, and how we deploy it. Um, and so, you know, we wanted to make sure that, uh, that application developers didn't really need to uh, understand SPT all that, all that deeply. They could be sort of isolated uh, from some of, this, some of these complications and also that they got everything configured right for, for all of those operational aspects. Um, it's very important to have, you know, sort of consistency across all of our applications. So the, uh, the approach we took to this, um, uh, SBT has a, has a plug-in architecture, so you, can, uh, so you can pull in functionality from other places. And uh, what's particularly nice is that um, this can be uh, recursive, so, so a plug-in can pull in other plugins, which allowed us uh, to write uh, the uh, extremely unoriginally named uh, Gilt SPT build plugin, uh, which aggregates a lot of other useful uh, SPT plugins and, and all of the common configuration that we expect people to be using. Um, and uh, this is just another piece of software within, uh, within our system. Um, it's, you know, it's a repository that's, uh, you know, we build the code uh, we version it like anything else. We release versions out into uh, into our Nexus <laughs> server like anything else um, through a very cool mind-bending feature of SBT. You can actually make the plugin compile itself. So uh, so all of the nice bells and whistles that everyone else is getting are also available when you're building and developing the uh, the plugin. Um, and uh, and and we've managed to make it really really simple. For the application developers to uh, to use all of this, um, so this is uh, this is an example of one of our SBT build specifications, um, and this is, I promise, the the entire thing. A lot of times, people remove stuff when they're putting together slides so it fits on the screen. Um, this is a complete build specification for one of our libraries, um, and so you know it, it's. Very simple. I mean, all you do is is pull in stuff from the uh, the plugin, specifying that uh, this is a project that you're going to package and uh, uh, publish a jar artifact. Um, it, we give it a name. So this is some uh, collection of tools for interacting with our uh, continuous integration, our Jenkins server, um, and then and then uh, list out your dependencies. Um, so this is all that the that the developer of this library needs to do. Um, and once they do this, they get a whole pile of functionality for free. Um, so fairly basic stuff like Nexus configuration. So we, uh, we, we mirror our, all of our dependencies in the local Nexus server. Um, also information for publishing onto that server. Uh, standard libraries for testing and coverage. Um, for services, we deploy them as, as RPM. So all the RPM packaging is provided uh, by the plugin. Uh, as well as standard run scripts for things, uh, new relic support. Uh, an email goes out every time you release a new version. Uh, the whole tech team gets an email with a listing of the uh, the changes in that. Um, 
few other interesting things. Um, uh, one of these actually that uh, is kind of cool. So SBT uh, is built on top of Ivy for dependency management. And um, conflict resolution in, in Ivy by default is um, not, not great. Uh, in particular, if you have two dependencies, which then uh, depend upon different major versions of the same library, uh, the default behavior is to just take the, the latest version and evict the older version. Um, and probably that thing that depended upon the older major version is going to stop working at that point. Um, so, uh, so our build system has some uh, semver analysis that we've built in to examine the dependency tree and warn developers if, uh, if a situation like that is detected. Um, we do a couple other things around uh, uh, detecting Scala cross builds that might be duplicating one another that, uh, that Ivy doesn't quite understand, um, and a bunch of other stuff. So um, I don't know how many people in this room have, any exp have experience with SBT, but um, uh, SBT also allows you to do these things called multi-project builds. This allows you to sort of bundle multiple code bases um, together in a way that they're released and, and versioned together. Um, and this is an, something that we use pretty widely uh, because our general philosophy is that when you uh, create a service, you should also uh, provide a client library for other people to interact with the service. Um, and we'd like those to be versioned together. So we have a fairly typical pattern where we have a, a server package a uh, client package and a, and a core package, which has sort of shared data types that are used by both. Um, and uh, generally, you know, SBT allows you to do this, but um, the build specifications are, are usually pretty complicated. It's, they're, they're more difficult than the, the single project builds. Um, but again, uh, Scala is a very flexible and powerful language, so we've been able to abstract that as well. So it, um, again, uh, this is um, a, a fairly complete uh, build specification for a multi-project build here. So, um, so we create this, uh, this trait, uh, client server core project, uh, which, which handles uh, defining a multi-project build um, completely for the, for the user. And they just need to specify, again, like what the name is. Um, in this case, they have to give three different dependency lists for the different packages. Um, and I've uh, not put in the details there because it wouldn't fit on the slide. Um, and then there's a few other uh, option, optional things which are available, um, including this, which I would uh, like to talk, to, talk about next, um, something that we call, that we call mm -hmm. Ion Cannon. Um, and Ion Cannon is, uh, is our continuous delivery system. Um, there is a a certain amount of debate in the literature about the distinctions between uh, continuous deployment and continuous delivery and exactly uh, what qualifies as, as what. Um, so I say, you know, what we've chosen to do here is that uh, we do continuous delivery on, at the granularity of a, a released version of a particular service. Um, we, with 200, uh, you know, 200 services, um, a hundred, you know, hundred plus developers in the company, uh, trying to do a deploy for every single commit, which happens across all of our code bases, was um, was a little daunting. Um, it probably would have required more uh, staging and test hardware than we really felt was was justified. So we needed to make things a little bit more granular, and, and this is uh, this is what we decided to do. Um, and so as a result, so of our, our development process. So it looks sort of like this. So most teams uh, have a, uh, a shared development and test environment that they, uh, that they use amongst themselves. So, and then a developer will typically start working on a new feature locally uh, with a set of SSH tunnels set, um, set up between their laptop and the, uh, and the shared environment for all the services that they're not working on directly. Um, obviously, you're not going to be able to run the, uh, the complete stack on, on a developer laptop. So, uh, so tunneling is pretty, pretty important there. Um, person develops locally, uh, gets their feature complete, submits it to Garrett for, uh, for peer review. Um, 
typically you and tests get run on Jenkins at the same time. Uh, and then once it passes uh, code review, then and we merge it in and, uh, and develop it out onto the, uh, the shared team environment uh, where it can undergo further testing by other developers or a QA engineer on the team. Um, and then once, uh, once the team feels like they have uh, something which they're ready to, to release, they, uh, they use, um, they run SBT release to, uh, to package it up and deploy it. Um, so this uses SBT's uh, standard, standard release plugin, uh, which provides a lot of stuff out of the box, but also allows you to customize your, uh, your release process. Um, and so in particular, uh, one of our customizations is that it can trigger uh, releases out into, uh, into IonCan. Um, and uh, so on the few slides back, um, that was configured with our uh, fast track option, which is a, a fully automated testing and, and deployment pipeline. So in this case, when you run SBT release, uh, the code gets packaged into an RPM, put into a YAM repository, uh, then deployed out onto a staging environment that mirrors the current state of production. Uh, we run automated tests. And, and in this case, uh, we sort of leave it up to the team developing a particular service to decide what the appropriate tests to run at that point are. So we actually, uh, they specify um, there's a metadata format within, within their, uh, their Git repository where they can say, you know, these are, these are the set of tests which have to pass uh, before this um, can go to production. Uh, so, and then, uh, so those tests are run. If they pass, we then, we promote the, uh, the service out into production and it'll get deployed in a, in a few minutes. Um, and if it fails, we roll back to the, the last good version. Um, just as a side note, uh, part of that promotion process is actually moving the RPM from a, from a testing YUM repository to a production YUM repository. So in that way, uh, we make sure that you can't ever accidentally install a, uh, a version that failed out onto the production machines. The production machines can only see the production YUM repo. Uh, the staging machine can see both the, uh, the test and production repos. Um, we, we have a, a web UI that allows people to sort of monitor what's going on, what things have recently deployed, what things are in testing at any given point. Um, and we also uh, have a, a Skype bot that goes and announces things into one of our chats as, as things are happening. So people keep fairly up to date on, uh, on what's going on. Um, uh, the person who releases something also gets an email notifications as well, so it's not all just this uh, transitory stuff in Skype. And uh, this, is, uh, this has been very popular. Um, we launched this system in November last year, and uh, we currently have uh, over 100 services and applications that are, uh, that are using this pipeline. Um, so this is the fast track. You may uh, infer that there's a slow track as well. Um, and the slow track uh, continues to automate deployment but allows people to insert a, a manual testing or approval uh, step. So uh, once again, you know, in our UI, once something deploys out into staging, uh, it can be tested and then, uh, then a, a QA engineer can, can come in and either uh, pass or fail the version that was submitted there. Um, in practice, this has been substantially less popular than the fast track uh, for, for a couple of reasons. Um, the main one, I, I believe, is just that the, the systems that don't have a lot of automated tests tend to be older systems which no one is really focusing on uh, modernizing them and bringing them up to date with the current build system and the current deployment tool chain. Uh, so uh, until, until they're using the current build system, we're, we can't really tie them into, uh, into all of this. And in general, as we update things or as we, as we rewrite things or break them out into, uh, into new services, people are pretty good about writing uh, automated tests in those cases. So tests typically come along with the modernization. Um, also to an extent, teams are doing manual testing on their, their, individual, uh, on their individual test environments. So that generally people have felt good enough about that, that uh, there hasn't been uh, a high demand 
for this, and it, it might be something that we end up deprecating eventually. Um, but other people might find that it's a good idea. So. Um, we also, uh, another reason is we've actually, um, over time, built better tools for doing UI testing. Uh, in particular, uh, we have a really nice um, uh, toolkit set up for doing Selenium testing. So uh, we've, we've built this in as an extension into SBT's uh, test mechanisms. So running this is just a matter of, of running SBT Selenium test. And uh, these tests are written you know, as Scala code uh, in your test directory side by side with, with unit tests and functional tests. Um, this is built on top of the uh, Scala test 2.0 uh, Selenium DSL that they added. But um, we've added a bunch of other uh, nice features on to make it easier for people to use uh, within, within our system. A lot of stuff that's specific, uh, specific to, to our application. Um, and this is nice, you know, once again, your, your tests are written in Scala. They're, they're in the same code base. You can reuse aspects of the code, uh, data structures, or whatever else that you need in terms of setting up and evaluating your tests. Um, so that's, uh, that's been pretty nice. You can run it on your laptop or on one of these team staging machines, um, but you, we also have a Selenium grid uh, that, we, that we have available for running matrix builds across different, uh, different OSs and different browsers. Um, and this is just sort of a, a, a skeleton of what one of these Selenium tests actually looks like. Uh, so, so this annotation is just is used by the build system to identify which tests are Selenium tests, which tests are unit tests, and, and so on. If there's no annotation, it's a unit test. If there's an annotation, then, then it's a more specialized test. Um, and, uh, and, and we're able to use some pretty uh, nifty features of, of Scala in here. Um, in particular, uh, for doing test fixtures, uh, there's this pattern in Scala called the stackable traits pattern, um, which you see used here, where we can actually uh, specify this sort of in the in the type signatures themselves, uh, various prerequisites before running the test, um, which is uh, I think I think pretty neat. Um, so that's a, a brief flavor of the testing. Um, which then brings us, I guess, our sort of the last step, last piece, which is which is deployment. Um, and uh, at this point, I have to issue a slight apology to the room. Uh, which is uh, when I wrote this abstract in February, uh, we expected to be a little bit further along on some of the things that I was going to talk about uh, than we are at the moment. So I'm going to outline some stuff that's mostly plans for the future. And I just wanted to be upfront with that because I don't want to claim that we have experience with this in production. Um, we do think it's a good idea, but it's not li live in production yet. So take, take that as a, as a small disclaimer. Um, our current deployment is primarily done in a pretty pretty old school way with uh, bare metal machines. Uh, we deploy multiple services onto each machine. Uh, when we upgrade, we upgrade in place. Um, and there's, it's pretty much a, a manual process to decide which services should run on which machines and looking at uh, resource requirements and uh, redundancy requirements and, and trying to find a good way to spread everything out. Um, our direction for the future is to uh, move things onto virtualized containers, uh, deploy things onto immutable LXC containers uh, with one service running for per container. Um, and here, by, by immutable, we mean that we actually we never upgrade in place. Uh, whenever we when we release a new version, we'll spin up a new container, install the new version into that container, and then uh, and and then uh, remove the old containers after. Uh, after the deployment. Um, and systems are able, again, to provide sort of through this metadata mechanism uh, what their resource requirements are. And then the system will, will find where, uh, where resources are available and deploy it. Uh, what we're using for this, um, so we're basing things on, on CloudStack, uh, which is a private cloud management system. Um, we, uh, we also evaluated OpenStack and Gennetti, which are other open source private cloud systems. Um, we found that CloudStack's APIs matched up most closely with, uh, with what we wanted to do. And um, 
but also we found some some hardware incompatibilities with OpenStack that uh, that made it look like that wasn't going to work in in our uh, uh, in our data centers. Um, and uh, one of our engineers uh, added uh, LXC support uh, into CloudStack. That's going to be released in CloudStack uh, 4.2 uh, later this summer, I believe. Um, we uh, we picked uh, LXC as the uh, as the container type that we're going to use, and uh, and this was based pretty much entirely on on performance benchmarking. Uh, so we we looked at, at LXC, KVM, and uh, OpenVZ. Um, OpenVZ requires a customized kernel. That was a road we didn't really want to go down, so that got crossed off the list pretty quickly. Um, and then we uh, and then we did benchmarks with LXC versus KVM. Um, and, and this was um, uh, actual production load benchmarking. So we, uh, we uh, created some containers on our production hardware, spun up uh, a few of our, our different services, um, and, and added them into the load balancer cluster. So for, uh, for during one of our sales, they were actually serving a fraction of the production traffic. Um, and uh, the results of that, basically the, the KVM had about a 50% uh, performance degradation relative to bare metal. Uh, LXC was only 10 to 15%. Um, and in some further investigations, uh, this was run using bridge networking mode. Uh, further investigations, we found that in direct networking mode, uh, almost all of that difference disappeared, and the, the LXC containers, uh, in most cases, were pretty much indistinguishable from bare metal in performance. Um, again, this is based on our workloads. You might find that uh, things perform differently uh, for you. We've had some reports of people who have found things the other way around, but, uh, but uh, this is basically was driving our, our decision. Um, and so, so the deployment sequence, you know, looks like uh, looks like this. So basically, you know, once once a version uh, has passed testing, is proved to release out to production, uh, then we run through a number of steps. So we uh, we create new containers to deploy it onto, install the new version out uh, onto those containers, uh, do a little bit of uh, JVM warm up on it to uh, to really get them get them humming, uh, and then start shifting things through our, using the load balancer APIs to move things over. Um, and then eventually we can delete the old containers. And, and that doesn't necessarily happen immediately. Um, you know, there can be nice to, to keep the old version around, uh, you know, maybe for a few minutes, maybe for a couple hours, depending upon how comfortable you are. But should you need to roll back, uh, that allows basically an instantaneous rollback if you keep those old containers up and running for, for a little while. Eventually, you need to recycle them just to get the capacity back, but it uh, doesn't need to be immediate. So, uh, wrap things up. Um, so, right, so, so we're running this, uh, this website with a very large number of, uh, of services and web applications and trying to keep our, uh, our application developers happy and productive and not worrying about a lot of these infrastructure details. Uh, and we... Uh, We've had good success with that uh, using, using SBT to create a, a really a powerful, uh, very abstract build system uh, that people can use without, um, with sort of a minimum of fuss. Uh, this uh, continuous delivery system and some really nice tools for automated testing. Uh, and then in the future, we're hoping to bring our, uh, uh, our deployment up on par with that with a really simple and consistent hardware provisioning scheme. Thank you all. Now, I'd be happy to take any questions. Um, I imagine with so many services, uh, they must all be fairly simple in what they do. Can you give an idea of the kind of. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there is, um, there is some, some variation in the complexity. Uh, some of them are. Um, at least in terms of the API that they present, uh, very simple. Um, like there, there is a service which is pretty much entirely devoted to uh, uh, keeping track of how many uh, account credits a user has. So, you know, so the uh, the 
request time API for some of these things um, can be very thin. Um, there's actually a surprising amount of work in the background to actually keep uh, what seems like a fairly simple data point like that up to date and consistent. Um, but, but things can be very small. Um, some things are larger, you know, our, uh, uh, our, you know, our checkout process, for example, um, has a, uh, a service backing it, which has a considerably richer API to it. And is there a lot of communication between the different services, or is it mostly you know, Fairly minimal crosstalk between services. I mean, some things branch downward, so one service call might might then reach out to, to a couple of others, but there, um, uh, those sorts of dependencies are pretty much one way. There doesn't tend to be much uh, horizontal uh, discussion between services. So what do you use for communication between services? And how do you handle discovery? Um, so communication uh, between services is uh, mostly HTTP requests. Uh, there are a few things. Um, that are doing things a little fancier that, uh, uh, for example, um, we use Zookeeper to, uh, to coordinate uh, a certain pieces of information between, uh, uh, between you know, uh, the machines running some of our services. Uh, so, so occasionally there's things like that, but for the most part, we're, we're just doing HTTP requests back and forth to uh, services and JSON over HTTP. Was each service in their own container one, one per service? Uh, that, that is the direction that we're going to go. And cur currently, no, but that is uh, how we want to do things in the future. The, uh, now, the actual data storage, the persistent storage, is that in the container or separate? Yeah, the, so the um, yeah, persistent data storage, you know, Postgres databases and such are, are outside of the container. No, and um, uh, you know, schema management and, and data evolution is sort of a, a whole other system which uh, I did not have time for today. Um, uh, our CTO uh, gave a talk about uh, what we do for, for schema evolution at um, one of the Postgres conferences a couple months ago. Uh, so if, if you're interested in, in looking that up, there is a talk. Um, that you can you can watch the video for that, that describes how we approach that, um, and our schema manager is actually um, something that we've open sourced, so it's on our uh, our GitHub page as well. Uh, so you said when you push to your staging environment, you can specify which tests you need to pass for the service to actually mm -hmm. be elevated to production. Do yeah. you specify other service tests on as part of that, or are you only running tests? Yes. So, so you could so you could specify that that you know functional tests for some other application or service uh, also need to be run and passed. So yeah. So if you know that uh, right that some other service depends critically on yours, you would probably want to run their functional tests as well. Yeah. Do you have a dedicated team or sub team or certain subset of developers who are responsible for developing and maintaining your internal build process tools? Or does yeah. Sort of no, it's um, it's a it's a pretty small group of people within the architecture team that uh, that that maintain the uh, the build the build system. Yeah, like, like I said, a, a lot of the motivation for doing this is to uh, isolate most people from the uh, mental complexity of, of of SBT and some of the stuff that's going on. So it's mostly been like two or three people who are pretty deep into that. Um, and then other people uh, generally don't have to worry about. It's also kind of a thankless job that everyone can do. It can be. Yeah. It's true. Okay. Are most of these services hitting a, a central Postgres database, or do they each tend to have their own schema and database? And um, the latter, how do you handle synchronization? Our, our general preference at this point is to have um, services or, or teams uh, be responsible for their own mm -hmm. data stores. And, and so we do have multiple. Postgres instances and, and multiple Mongo instances that are that are up for different services. Um, that said, there's still uh, an awful lot of residual data which is still in that that monolithic Postgres uh, database that the Rails application still talks to, and and uh, and various other things will talk to that as well. But but we'd like to teach.
Um, yeah, that's well. <laughs> I mean, we you know we we use uh, uh, we use well we use Rabbit for some things for moving data around. Um, we've also uh, used some uh, Postgres log replication tools for uh, for moving things from for migrating from one database to another. Um, it's yeah, some of that gets pretty complicated. It's maybe a little I'll skip here, but I can I can talk with you more later if you like. Um, Yes. Sir, are you managing um, versions between your services? And if so, just at the service level or at the endpoint level? Or how do you deal with the interfaces between some of the different, I guess, modular services? Uh, we do generally version the uh, the endpoints that uh, that services provide. So if a, if a service needs to change its API, um, yeah, that that's you know built into the, the URLs. And so they would add an, an additional, uh, you know, go from V1 to V2. Uh, in the in the paths that they're hitting, and then maintain backwards compatibility for a while until until we can upgrade everything else that's using it. All right, that's no more questions. Uh, thank you guys again for coming.